Sí, sí, sí. Sí, sí, sí. Sí, sí, sí. So this is the first lecture of the IGAP ICT yeah, okay. seminar. about moderate phases of sheets. And this is the first talk by Lothar about virtual topological invariance of moderate phase of sheets and back of this environment. So you are free to go. Okay, thank you very much. I mean, this, this is just uh, an overview talk. So uh, uh, later there will be more lectures with more details. So therefore I also have uh, the slides. I mean, later we will have blackboard talks to explain it more slowly. Now, uh, maybe this will be better to be much before, but here is a relatively short time, but we, we can just try. So, so, what are we talking about? So, we want to look at, want to compute and study topological invariance of modelized spaces. So, <clears throat> so let S be a smooth, projective, complex surface, H an ample line number on the surface. And we assume that the first 30 number of S is zero. And the geometric genus, which is, uh, is bigger than zero, that means there exists a non-vanishing non holomorphism for all sides. Yeah. And so then we can look at the monolith space of stable sheaves uh, on S, which turns out to C1, C2. So, uh, so rank R, H semi stable sheaves. So I have here um, written down the definition of what the semi stable sheet means. So it means that the sub sheets uh, are not too large in the sense that they don't have too many sections, even though crisply twisted by the uh, power of an ample line mass. So there exists a so called coarse modular space for this. Uh, for the sheets, so this is a space which parameterizes all of them up to isomorphism um, and uh, there's some nice properties. So <coughs> this is uh, the modular space M equal to M S H R C one C two. It usually will be singular, often even very singular, so not a manifold. It has a number attached to it which is the exact dimension which is the dimension that it should have if it was a nice space, but when it's not nice, it's 
would have a different dimension, but I will talk more about that later. And obviously, so the virtual dimension is the 2RC2 minus R minus 1 to 1 squared plus R squared minus 1, the whole more with all the characteristics of S, where the C1 to 2 are the churn classes. If you don't remember, I mean, I expect you most people know what they are, but there's some homology classes in this uh, which uh, tell us about uh, how far away the bundle is from the pivot. And you know, here on the surface, um, you know, we can turn the self intersection of the one square with a number if we, if we evaluate it on the fundamental class, like here, and the, or the second term class can also be used as an integer. And so then this is just a number. And so now it's just two. Oh, yeah. And so let's first look at the simplest case, which is in some sense the case of rank one, although it first doesn't look like it. So this is the case of Hilbert schemes of points. So <clears throat> we denote Sn the Hilbert scheme of zero dimensional subschemes of length n on S. So this is a um, nice uh, scheme which parameterizes uh, you know, the zero dimensional subscheme. So what are these? So a general point of it would just be a set of n distinct points on S. Um, but these points can come together, in which case uh, we have a non rigid key structure. And then, um, so in principle, so such a, a subscheme will be given by an ideal sheet, IC, in the structure sheet of S. So say the holomorphic function would vanish on the subscheme, the quotient with the structure sheet of the scheme, of the subscheme, and the length n is the total dimension of this structure sheet. As a vector space, <coughs> uh, just you know, it's an R team uh, thing, and so it's finite dimension, and that's the number of points. Okay, now this is my this. So, um, it is a well known fact to the topography that this uh, Hilbert scheme is smooth projective and has dimension 2f, so in particular, smooth compact and has dimension 2f. And now, what does this have to do with modelized space of sheets? If I take the modelized space of rank one sheets with respect to any ample bundle on S with the second chunk as C2 viewed as a number, that is equal or economically isomorphic to the Hilbert scheme of C2 points by just associating the, so the sub scheme is ideal sheet. So the ideal sheet will automatically be stable. Because there's basically no condition, and the, the, uh, the second churn class will be equal to the length of the subscheme. Okay, so this is this case, and in this case, you want to compute some topological invariant. So, the simplest topological invariant one can think of is the top topological Euler number. That's the alternating sum of the petty numbers, and it's your. Know, Something which is very easy to compute for any kind of reasonable topological space, one can compute it. <clears throat> and so we will want to compute it in this case. And so uh, the answer is uh, you know, something I knew very long time ago. <clears throat> so we can make a generating function for these Euler numbers. So we compute the Euler number of the Hilbert scheme of endpoints, we take the sum. For all n bigger than zero is all a number such as to the n, and then this is given by this uh, simple generating function. So we have um, the product over all n bigger than zero, one minus x to the n for a number of s. In particular, we see that the order number of the Hilbert scheme depends only on the order number of s, and also that there's this very complex formula which gives them all once. And uh, now we could ask ourselves, are there Similar formulas in higher ranks, and one should note maybe, I mean, that uh, this denominator is essentially the model of form. It's a usually eta function up to this trivial factor here. And um, so, therefore, uh, and so uh, the result that we uh, or what from physics now uh, becomes a, a paper by Robert Whitner, which is also very old, 
um, which gives an explicit conjectural formula uh, for the generating function of these order numbers in the ring two case in terms of order forms. I will later say a few more words for order forms, but not very much. <coughs> um, okay, so let me try to first take this result of this and from the mathematics point of the lecture. So in the we talk, we assume that so I, I stable is equal to semi-stable, which is a condition on, on one, so it means that the modular phase of table sheet is already compact. And, and we assume for simplicity for now that uh, there exists a smooth connected curve in the canonical linear system. So that means so occurs a smooth connected curve as a zero set for holomorphic two forms. Okay, you can make this assumption. This will be true in many cases. You know, for instance, for uh, minimal search of general type or many other cases. So and, the, and we write as before, KS squared is uh, we take the first term that from that squared and we, we evaluate it on S and uh, we also get a little more color effect a reminder of the exact dimension of the modelized phase. And we put R equal to two and we get it to write this formula differently. Um, <coughs> so we have the virtual dimension, oops, and that goes too far. And then we again have this theta function. Now I've normalized it by taking away this factor x on one over 24. And we have another modular form, which is the standard theta function, theta of x. Which is just the sum over all integers x to the n squared. And then we have uh, this conjecture by Buffer and Witten, or I mean this formula. <coughs> uh, I don't think, uh, anyway, so which is uh, that in some sense, again, in a generating function for the Euler numbers of the smaller spaces, although it's written slightly differently, namely uh, the Euler number of the modular space of rank two sheets. Turn class D1 to 2 on S will be uh, determined as follows. We write down this function uh, 8 times 1 over 2 theta bar of x squared to the 12 to the power of one of all effects, I think. And then um, uh, this other term is 2 theta bar so the x to the 4 squared divided by theta of x uh, to the power of the self intersect of the canonical class. <laughs> So these are two basic uh, topological invariants of the algebraic surface. Uh, and just in terms of this, one can, uh, so one writes down this expression and then one takes the coefficient of x to the dB, where dB is uh, the expected dimension dB of this modular space. Okay, so it's a very nice formula, which is you know, for all surfaces under these conditions, for all values of two and two, uh, you know what the order number is. Okay, so you want to first see in what sense this formula uh, might be true, and want to check whether uh, it is indeed true. And we want also to look at refinements of the formula, not in the chapter but later. So it's instead of the order number of a finer topological invariant, and we want to generalize it to higher range. So not just make so let me first make give another so first i want to say uh, how i want to interpret this form so as i said this modelized space is usually quite singular and its dimension might be different from the virtual dimension as a matter of fact it can only be larger not smaller than the virtual dimension but anyway so <coughs> And uh, so how can one describe the situation? So the modelized space is singular, which means that the tangent dimension of the can be singular, that means the dimension of the tangent space would be larger than the dimension of the space. So at every point in the modelized space, we have a, a tangent space, which is given by the trace tree x1 of fx. So don't know, so just clarify the extension of f with f and the obstruction tree, the natural obstruction tree would be the x2 of the set, like often in this subject. And the 
virtual dimension actually turns out to be the difference of these two, the dimension of the tangent space minus the dimension of the obstruction. So um, it is a maybe a non trivial I mean, it, it is a fact that this dimension is always constant, it's independent of that. But the individual dimension, the dimension of the tangent space, the dimension of the obstruction space, depends on it. Um, actually, one can use this. So, what is there's a, something finer is two, is this Guanishi map, which locally describes the modular space near F, near the point corresponding to the sheet F. There is an analytic map, the Guanishi map from the tangent space from an open neighborhood of zero to the tangent space uh, at F to an open zero neighborhood of zero in the obstruction space. F, such that an analytic neighborhood, so an analytic topology neighborhood of F in the modelized space is isomorphic to the inverse image of zero. Okay, so in other words, you could say that locally in the analytic topology, um, M is given by the dimension of the obstruction space equations. In a, vector, in, a, in a fine space of dimension, right? the tangent space. Okay. Okay. So, in particular, if the obstruction space is zero, then the modelized space will be non singular of dimension, the expected time. So, um, <clears throat> now, however, the modelized space is usually singular, and that's very difficult to deal nicely to singular spaces. So there is, so Bert and Fanteki have introduced the notion of the perfect obstruction theory, which allows you to somehow pretend that the modelized space is smooth, even though it isn't. So, so what is true in this case is that there is a complex, so just of two vector bundles, one vector bundle to the next on M, so on the modelized space, such that for every point in the modelized space, the tangent space is the kernel of this map, and the obstruction space is the co okay. So that means we have in one, you know, in one fell swoop or in one step, just this two vector bundles together with map between them. Tell us everything about the tangent and the obstruction. So, <clears throat> although you know the so the, the tangent and obstructions can jump in dimension all over the place, but there are these two vector bundles which know everything about it. And this information is enough to get some uh, very nice things. The first one can do like trivial things. You can say define the virtual tangent bundle just as the difference between these two. Vector bundles in K theory, so I mean, there's a formal sum of vector bundles. The virtual dimension that I have said before can also be described just as the rank of this virtual tangent bundle, which is the, the difference of these two dimensions. But the, the very interesting thing that one can define by that, you know, in this situation, which was defined by experience for taking, is the virtual fundamental class. So this is. A class in homology in the homology degree which corresponds so uh, twice the virtual dimension of the modelized space so it is like it was the fundamental class of a manifold of a, of a compact uh, a variety of a smooth compact variety of dimension dd and it behaves also in many ways like the fundamental class like the actual fundamental class. And so um, one can, you know, just to think of it, you can think of this perfect of existence of a perfect obstruction theory as some kind of virtual form of smoothness. So somehow the modelized space is not smooth, but it remembers in the form of this obstruction theory that it wanted to be smooth. And one can use this intention to do things as if it was smooth. Okay. So, um, now, in particular, we can use this 
to define the a virtual version of the OLAN. So the <clears throat> So it's a, a classical result. The index theorem that if you have a smooth compact manifold or smooth protected variety, the, uh, uh, the Euler number is equal to the evaluation of the log term stars of the tangent bundle of M, so uh, uh, on, on the fundamental collapse of M. So the Euler number is equal to this. This is a classical result on fine system. I think that there are also elementary proofs. And we just use this as a definition of the virtual Euler number. So we write down the same thing where we put a V whenever we feel like it. So the uh, fundamental class is replaced by the virtual fundamental class. And the tangent bundle is replaced by the virtual tangent bundle. And we call this the virtual Euler. So this is uh, this thing. And now uh, the conjecture that uh, a kind of precise form of the Sotomitsky conjecture that we formulate is that the Debarkovitsky formula will hold if we, instead of the actual order number of the modular space, which one has no idea how to compute and which most likely, for which most likely will not be true, and one takes the virtual version of the order. Okay. So this is this. Now, <clears throat> let me, I want to briefly look at the slightly more general version of this to put it uh, also so that I can use the direct invariant, which I will need later anyway. So, this is for the case when there's, we don't have a, not so necessary a smooth connected curve in the phenomenal linear system. So, direct written invariants are well known invariants of differential. Four manifolds, um, which uh, many people have studied, but in, in algebraic geometry, they are very simple. So, if the four manifold is a smooth projective algebraic surface, uh, then over the complex numbers, then uh, the Dalbert invariance just associates to every class in the second cohomology a number, which is the corresponding Dalbert invariance. And we call the class in the second cohomology a double written class if this invariant, this number, is W of A is not zero. And it is the case that there will be only finitely many A for which it is not zero. Um, so, as I said, for algebraic surfaces, they are very easy to compute. For instance, if we are in a situation we had before that the first written number of S is zero, you may see your minus is bigger than zero, and the canonical uh, uh, line bundle contains, uh, and the canonical linear system contains the smooth connected curves, then there are only two double bit classes, namely zero, so the class zero in the second homology for which the double bit invariant is one, and the canonical class for which the double bit class, double bit invariant is minus one to the form of the qualified. So all of the double bit invariants are either plus or minus one. And then this was the reason for the assumption we made before, because then the formula was simpler. So in general, the formula is like this. We have the same, uh, if now we don't make this assumption, we have to do the terms of the double bit invariance. So S is a smooth projected surface with, uh, again, P1 0, Pg bigger than 0. We have the same model of forms as before, the eta function. Uh, uh, Theta function, <clears throat> and then we write down a very similar formula where we, however, now have to sum over all double written classes, and then we basically have the same function, so only we I mean, can see the formula is very similar to before, but uh, slightly more complicated if we sum over the double written So this is this. Uh, okay. So much for. Uh, but now I want to talk about buffer written invariants. So the point is that I actually lied to you. So if you look at the formula of buffer and written, it does not, it is not precisely the formula I gave you. There are more terms in it. 
but these terms are not supposed to correspond to the Euler number of modular spaces of sheaves on S, but to something S, to something else. And so, so there are these extra terms in the Watt-Hobbiton formula, and the question is, what do they mean? And so, recently, Tanaka and Thomas defined these invariants mathematically. Uh, the, you know, via modelized spaces of Higgs pairs, and perhaps that is what these are. And so maybe I. Uh, so first, this again looks like the modelized space. So we take again S the smooth projective surface with an ample divisor. And the Higgs pair is now a pair of a torsion free sheet on S and a so called Higgs field. Which is a homomorphism from E to E tensor the canonical class. You could say it's an endomorphism of E, however, with values in the canonical line one. And we want this to have J0. Um, and there ex again exists a modelized space for such pairs, you know, stable pairs, with, where E has the bank R in turn class C1, C2. And the so the definition of stability, which allows us to construct a modelized space, is very similar to the corresponding position for modelized space of sheets. Uh, the only the difference, so we the difference is now we don't require this inequality that we have for stability for all subsheets of F, but only for all subsheets which are invariant under P. So where this Higgs field maps F to F tensor pairs. So we have we have to come, so it's therefore. And um, if you have a stable a Higgs pair, it's not necessarily true that the corresponding bundle has to be stable. Okay. Now, there's another completely different description of the same space, which uh, uh, I just briefly say, we don't need it very much. <clears throat> so there's an alternative description of this modelized space. So here, namely as a modelized space of sheaves on a threefold. Instead of on the surface. So we look at the total space of the canonical line bundle on S, so that means the threefold over the surface S, where the fiber over every point are the fibers of the canonical line bundle. So it's a threefold. It's obviously non compact because the fibers uh, uh, can be scaled with the complex numbers. And so we look at this. Now we want to associate so the thing we had before. So P P is a sheet on this space. I give only a rough description because if one does a property, it would. Uh, I mean, I think and I Thomas take like fifty pages or so to correct correctly. So therefore, let me just hint at it. So assume we have such a Higgs field. So E is a sheet, and we have P from E to E tends to S. And now, if I have a, I want to see what this does fiber wise. So if we take a point X and S, we can look at the corresponding max P restricted on the fiber. So there's a map from EX to EX, EX tensor K. And so this is basically an endomorphism of the X. So it has eigenspaces or generalized eigenspaces and eigenvalues of generalized eigenvalues. So it will have some eigenspaces V, X, V, I, where the eigenvalues. As a map to suppose the E tensor of S are actually elements in the fiber of Kx. And so it has eigenspaces Vx, Vi uh, for the eigenvalues Vi and Kx. And so, so uh, our sheet E, e so e, e, we associate the sheaf on the total space of the canonical bundle, bundle line bundle, this fiber over the point X, Vi in the total space of Ks is just the corresponding eigenspace. Now it's obviously not very clear that this whole thing glues together to a sheet on X times yeah, I've kind of just told you what the fibers of the sheet are. Uh, you can see it will be something which is uh, as a kind of finite map to S, it lies in the in the fibers of the canonical it lies in the canonical bundle, but it's kind of fibers over S and there will be over every point in S, there will be finite points. 
where it's reported. And so in the end, you get that this distortion sheaf uh, whose support has dimension two on this canonical class. And in fact, um, you can go back uh, to the previous thing. And so that it means that these, the modelized space of these things is isomorphic to the modelized space of X pairs that I defined before. It's, uh, it gives me a different description of it, which looks quite different. So you can also view it as some kind of. Uh, Um, and so now it's not, maybe I shouldn't have said this thing, but um, you can see that there is a C star action on, uh, on this model I see, if I look at it in this way, namely I can, the C star acts on uh, the total space of the S by just rescaling the fibers of the S. Well, vector in the, in the fiber of S just in fact case multiplied by T and C star. I just mean, I just, if I let T and C star operate in it, it just means I multiply. Right? And then uh, this action lifts to an action on this one line space by just say, pulling back the sheaves via the action. And so we give an, get an action of C star on the one line space. And then um, now, the point here is that, uh, well, anyway, so we have to remember what we want to do is we want to compute some, we want to determine, define and maybe compute some work of Wittgen range. So we want to associate some numbers to the topology, to the topology of the space. So usually you can't do this if the space is not compact, you know? And so we have to, and this modelized space, NSH RC1, C2, is certainly not compact because we have, parameterizes the sheaf E together with phi, and we can always multiply phi by any complex number. And so it will not be complex. Um, but we have this other action, we have this action by C star, and the fixed point locus will be complex. And uh, it's actually, we can see in a moment what it is. Um, just, I should say that this modelized space also has an obstruction theory, I mean, a perfect obstruction theory as before, which in addition is what is called symmetric, but which in particular means that the expected dimension of this modular space is zero. No? So in some sense, virtually it's just a finite set of points, even though it's simple, even if it's one And so now just, now we want to define these invariants, although the space is not compact, and that's a little bit difficult, maybe you will not be able to maybe understand all the symbols here, but uh, I mean, I'm not so that I, I mean, certainly not everybody could understand all the symbols until now, but uh, those who understood them until now will not understand most of this here. So anyway, if M is, is a compact manifold of virtual dimension zero, then I can integrate one over the virtual fundamental classes to call this the virtual number of points of this system. No, because if uh, we wouldn't take the virtual fundamental class, but the fundamental class and the extra dimension was zero, it would be the number of points. Um, so if M has a C star action, which is uh, whatever compatible with the obstruction theory, there's a theorem which is called virtual localization, which allows you to uh, replace the integration or evaluating on the virtual fundamental class by that on the virtual fundamental class of the fixed point locus. So you have a much smaller space in which you can compute, which you can maybe understand much better. But you get the, you know, as a price, you have to integrate something crazy, which is the one over the equivalent Euler class of the virtual normal bundle of the fixed point locus, whatever. <clears throat> so now the point here is, this was true if M is compact and has a C star action. M is not compact, but it has a C star action and the expected dimension is zero. So then why aren't we just staring and say, okay, this theorem, I mean, this would be a theorem. This theorem doesn't hold, it doesn't make sense because one of the two sides is not defined. We just use uh, this thing to define the other. Okay. Now, I 
don't know precisely how this I now <clears throat> okay so this is what they do now unfortunately it's a bit difficult to see what this is now on the next slide which I could show you or not I have defined what this thing is but it's a little bit complicated I don't know whether you want to see it. <laughs> what I mean, we start with onion flakes, so you are uh, Yeah, okay, so I can very quickly say this. So, so this, um, as I said, Hannah and Thomas have taken this uh, as a definition. So, the virtual number of points is defined to be the integral over the virtual fundamental class of the six point locus of one over the. Normal bus. Now, what is this? So, first, we have to see what is the virtual normal bus. So, we have the, uh, the tangent bundle of n, we can restrict it to uh, the fixed point locus. Now, as this is fixed, it means that now the, this bundle is equivalent to the uh, C star x on the fibers, so which preserves the fibers. And then now, therefore, it decomposes into eigenspaces for the action where the uh, eigenvalues are powers of t. When you take a t in c star, then it acts by uh, the uh, c star x by multiplied by powers of t. Now we have unfortunately to remember that the virtual tangent bundle is a difference of two vector bundles, so we have the difference of two such decompositions. And this would be then the virtual normal bundle is a difference of two such sums of uh, Eigen bundles of weight i, so we are on the fiber, and t is c star x by multiplying by t to the i. And then the virtual normal bundle is just the part where this uh, weight is non zero. So you just take that. So that's why they call it the moving part where, this, where t moves up. And now, so then we know what this t virtual is, this virtual normal bundle. So then we have this equivalent Euler class. That uh, looks even more scary. Now, here I can, however, just write it formally. Um, so let's just take epsilon to be a variable, so some extra variable, which then eventually will cancel out. <coughs> and then, uh, if I have one of these time bundles, then the virtual, uh, then the order number of it. The equivalent order number is this expression. We take the sum of k equal to the rank of the i, the i churn class, the k churn class of the i times i, remember that i goes away, times epsilon to the rank of the i times k. Okay, so we have this expression. So for a moment, we'll just see this as a phase of formal expression. And then the equivalent virtual, the equivalent order class will be this portion of product. So you multiply this Euler class for the EI by the product of the Euler class of the S. Okay, so this is the answer. And you know, as you see, you know, one could wonder where does this you know, where does this even live? You know, these are formal classes, this is the variable, and you can take the quotient, but so somehow this will be in you know this will be a, a rational function. Uh, in epsilon with uh, coefficients in the cohomology of, uh, of this modular space. So then one can here integrate it over this, which means one integrates the cohomology class part of it over it. And what comes out will be a rational function in epsilon, which however turns out to be a number. And that's the yeah. answer. Okay. So, I mean, it's complicated, but you know, it's in the end, I want to maybe just show that it's not some, you know, it's actually something concrete. You, know, you can compute it, it's not something. Uh, and now let's look a bit more at this. Uh, we wanted to compute this, uh, this virtual number of points by integration of a fixed point locus. So if you want to do that, we have to know something about fixed point locus. So let's describe the fixed point locus. So 
let's say E phi is an element in the fixed point of course on the small light plane. So one can always assume that our sheet is equivalent to the T uh, that T star X on it. And if it's equivalent, we have as before a weighted composition. You can write here as a direct sum of sheets where the weight of the action on EI is I for each EI. And I've kind of said how the action can be passed by scaling uh, the fibers of AS on this total space. This leads to the fact that the weight of the action of the, on the canonical line bundle is one. And so if we have an, an equivalent map from EI, to EJ and the PS, this can be invariant, so of weight zero, which means the fixed point of the action, uh, if and only if the difference J is equal to I minus one. You know, because here, if X on one side is multiplied by T to the I, here it's multiplied by T to the J plus one. And um, you know, to be invariant means it sends everything to itself, so it sends T to the I to T to the I. And so this only works if J is equal to uh, I plus. And so uh, if one puts this together, we find that the fixed points can be described as follows. We, have, we can write E as a direct sum of such eigenspaces where uh, all of them occur from 0, 1, and so on until sum GL. And if I respect our P to one such sum in EI, it will always map to EI minus one and to S. It doesn't map to any other sum. No, the P is from this sum to the whole sum and to S, but the restriction to one of the EI will always map to the, to the next one, which is some from the fact that has to be invariant. And the last one, or the first one, has nowhere to go. And, and uh, <clears throat> so this follows from this description. And in addition, so we wanted the sheet to be stable, and the, the, the pair to be stable. That it's pair, that the pair is stable means in particular that the kernel of the map can only have one sum. And so that means, so one sum is this zero of the kernel. So all the other maps have to be checked. And so therefore we see that the ranks must decrease. Um, and obviously the sum of all the ranks is R. So the ranks form a partition of R. And so we get a decomposition of the fixed point locus into unions of connected components and parameterized by partitions of R. Okay. And so, uh, so this, uh, this is the description of the fixed point locus. And so in particular, we want to single out two of them. One is what sometimes called the horizontal component, is where the partition just consists of one number, of the number R, so the trivial partition. So that means in this case that E is equal to E0, and the map phi is the zero map. So if phi is the zero map, then the Higgs pair is, is just the same as just a sheet. In the modular space of sheets, and the sheet has to be stable. So we see this fixed point component corresponding to the trivial partition is just the modular space of table sheets. And uh, then we could go all the way to the opposite end and have the partition just being 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, R times, and that somehow is called the vertical component. So, okay, so now I want to, you know. It's a bit, uh, shouldn't be scared by this, but anyway, so if, uh, if one doesn't know something, one uh, puts it into generating function and then it looks as if one would know something. So we make a generating function of all these numbers that we don't know. And, and you know, there's, you know, we have here some trivial factor because we want later some modularity. So now Q down to virtual dimension, we have normalized by two R. And there's this sign for some reason which you see in a moment. And then we count the virtual number of points. This modelized 
So we have a generating function of all of those to call it Z as you are. So by what I just said, I can write this like taking the plus R out here. That I can write it as a sum of all lambda of the contribution of uh, this part of the fixed point locus because the invariant is computed on the fixed point locus. It's this fixed point locus is the disjoint union of uh, these components. So uh, the, the total thing is just the sum of the contributions over uh, fixed point locus uh, over these uh, fixed point locus that are by partition. So in particular, we can look at the one corresponding to the to the trivial partition R. We have seen that the modelized space of the part of the model, the, the, this fixed point locus is just the modelized space of stable sheaves. And then it's not difficult to prove that everything matches up nicely with the uh, with the abstraction theory and so on, so that up to sign this virtual number of points of this thing to the order number of this modular space of sheets. And so we get in particular that the part of this partition function corresponding to, uh, to the trivial partition is up to the trivial partition. That, and this renormalization just is a generating function for the order numbers of the modular space of sheets on the space. Uh, so, in particular, we see in what sense this Wapowitzian partition function contains the gen generating function of the virtual order numbers of the modular space of stable sheets. Okay. okay. Now, I want to briefly talk about modularity properties for this. I mean, also, if, you know, I have mentioned modular forms before, so you should at least have the biggest idea. What this might be except for the two stupid examples I gave. So, um, obviously, I do not try to say something uh, very, uh, to say very much. So, a modular form of weight k is by definition a holomorphic function on the complex upper half plane, which satisfies some nice transformation properties under. The action of F to Z by this broken linear transformation. So ABCD is a matrix then F to Z and F is sent to F, F of tau is sent to F of A tau plus B divided of plus B, and then this is just obtained by multiplying by C plus B. So one the transformation property is that this just goes back to So this S to Z is just it's basically generated by two elements, one is T. Which under this transformation then tau to tau plus one. And actually, this invariant property will then just say that f of tau must be equal to f of tau plus one. So it's a periodic function. And then the other generator is s, which sends tau to minus one. There's also another property. So if you have this thing that it's uh, Periodic with period one, it means it has a Boolean uh, development. So f of tau can be written as a sum of all, of all n in z, a n q to the n, with a n to the number, and q is equal to two pi tau. But we, in addition, require that only uh, that the only non-zero coefficients are positive. Okay, uh, we will also be concerned. I mean, well, anyway. You can also have modular functions, which are quotients, modular forms of the same way. And then uh, we can also look more general modular forms for some subgroups of the uh, FA2Z, which then, if you want, so often instead of the full group, one has a subgroup, and then there are more modular forms, which one requires less. So, anyway, so this is, is just this. And now the thing is that in some, the claim is that in some sense, the this partition function will behave like a modular form. So that so S duality uh, predicts uh, the behavior of this generating function under modular transformation. So it's a bit so we can 
write a more complicated version of the same. So we take this generating function as before. So we know that it was S A B C one. Now, now here we take the sum over all over a system of representatives of the second homology of S that uh, divided by R times the second homology. Um, and we multiply by a root of unity and take the sum like this. And this we call the second this is the so-called Langer's theorem addition function. No, this is the unity. <coughs> and then, then the conjecture, uh, I mean this is our form of the conjecture. So if I got the numbers right, um, is that under this non-trivial element of the uh, say to Z, uh, these two things are related. So the you know, up to some what the factor here is the sign, uh, just the, the partition function we had before becomes the one for the standard. And so why is that interesting? And one thing is that you know what we expect is one and prove it in general, but um, for us here, we are interested, you know, it's not obvious, but I just say it now, if one looks at how this behaves for the contributions for the different point locals, it will exchange the contribution of uh, the one for the trivial partition and for the partition one, 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 one. And uh, there's another result by Thomas, which says that if I is a prime number, then this one of the partition, so, uh, so just the, 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 uh, will be zero unless we have here either is the partition R or one to the R. So, um, how should I put it? Um, so in fact, that is not just the, if we take the virtual number of points of the, of the small like space, it will be of that. Part or fixed point of point will be zero. So, um, therefore, we see that there are only two terms in this case, and they are exchanged by this transformation. And so, if we believe in the S variance conjecture, you know, one of them will be. And so, obviously, we, you know, we have done some computations, we check that we can grab all these computations actually true and we also on the other hand use it to make some prediction. But let me say a few words what we actually do. How much time do we actually have? Yes, you have 10 minutes. Okay, I think that's the so we uh, computed up to some high order in Q this uh, thing which is the smaller number one of these sheaves I mean generate the factor of all numbers so up to high perfect dimension of one space to compute it with in general for n s when the rank is at most three and we compute it with this other one when the rank is at most five so we therefore also have the same prediction on the other side and the defined generating point you know when we you know, when we look at uh, this kind of the first whatever 10 20 30 coefficients we can identify some Modular forms, and so we uh, find formulas for these generating functions in terms of modular forms, uh, which is the high as the rank grows get more and more complicated. If I had a lot of time, which I didn't then, perhaps I could show you the terrible formulas, uh, but I won't. Um, and so now let me briefly see, say how we want to do these computations. So in both cases, you now one is supposed to either compute on the small life spaces of sheaves or on these fixed point loci in the uh, fixed uh, in this uh, fixed model space. And in both cases, one wants to reduce the computation to computations of intersection of product of little schemes of points on X. So let me first just say a few words how this would go for this the fixed uh, thing. So if we look at this, and C star one one one. This will parameterize C zero plus and one plus C R. 
where the pi are all keys of length one. And so, therefore, if I have a, a, a torsion coefficient of length one, like here, it must be of the form an ideal sheet of a zero dimensional subkey times the line bar. And that's a standard fact. So, therefore, these ideal sheets will be somehow parameterized by this little key. You would see the point, and so you can somehow see that you would expect that you can describe this whole situation in terms of products of Hilbert schemes of points. So, we need products of R Hilbert schemes of points on S, and one can indeed do that, although it's not work, which some people have done. Um, and so, one can in the, in the end, if one wants to compute this integral we are to compute, we can. Uh, uh, do this uh, as in uh, some intersection number of products of Hilbert schemes of points. So I won't, don't want to do this now. I might do this in the lectures to some extent. In the case for the other part, the model I say rank sheaves, rank R sheaves on, on S, it's less obvious how I would go to Hilbert schemes of points, but we use a uh, formula by Mochizuki, which uh, uh, yes, for so. So let's so for to, to be able to roughly explain it uh, by uh, the strips of the case at the rank two. So maybe I should show this. You know, we start in one part of the case anyway. But so we look at this one-line space. We want to compute intersection numbers on this one-line space in terms of intersection numbers of Hilbert schemes of points. So on S times the modular space, you can assume you have a union of two sheets. <coughs> um, so that means if the sheet on S times on S times the modular space, that if I restrict it to S times this point corresponding to a sheet, it is that sheet. And then we can use this universal sheet to, uh, to define the many cohomology classes on the modular space. You can take the term classes of this universal sheet. You multiply them by the fullback of any homology class on S, and you push forward to the modelized space. And, and this I call the power I of I. And now, uh, Mochizuki's formula gives us if you take any polynomial with a P of E, any polynomial in these classes, Mochizuki's formula will express it. Uh, you know, if, if I integrate this thing over the vertical fundamental class, then this number is then expressed in terms of intersection numbers of products of Hilbert schemes on S and double digits. So now let me just go through this. So we have this product Hilbert scheme. So we work on S times this product Hilbert scheme. We have to protect Now we have this important thing. So, so we, if we have two line bundles, we can look at two different kinds of sheets on uh, on S. Uh, on so one is we take the ideal sheet. So we take a sheet on this product such that if I restrict this to the surface times the points corresponding to the subscheme, it's just the ideal sheet of the i subscheme, the one or two. Uh, Tensorized with the corresponding line bundle. Okay. The other one is the topological sheet, so O of I, o I of I, I. So this is a sheet on the product of the two Hilbert schemes, which, if I restrict it, so which you know, on two points, so on, on a point corresponding to two subschemes, it's just the I, the structure sheet of the I point tensorized with this line bundle. Okay. So this would be. Two natural vector bundles, or sorry, two natural sheets of it. And then there's a terrible formula which I don't write, but we want to compute something like this. So this is something in this power pi. And then the claim is the following there exists some Laurent polynomial in S, sufficient uh, classes. So I mean, it's not so important what precisely. So we have a, a, such a long polynomial uh, in a variable s, an x 
vector variable s, where we replace now the tau i, yeah, so also tau i of alpha, uh, where now tau i bar is, we take, instead of, we write down the same thing as we get before for e, when we look at the previous one, we have these, where here we have the uh, universal sheet, we just replace the universal sheet by this direct sum of these sheets. So write down the same formula. This gives us some form of charts on the product of Hilbert schemes. And we have so this, this polynomial is a strong polynomial S whose coefficients are expressions in these and in the turn classes of these. So something very complicated, such that we can, you know, we can write down a generating function like this. I thought it's complicated, but anyway, so I thought that. Now, this is a bit fast, but it's not so, so important what the size is. We can, so we have written down this. Now we can first do the following we integrate this thing over this product of Hilbert schemes. So, as it was before, a Laurent polynomial whose coefficients are from all the classes, we will get just a Laurent polynomial in S. We call it like this. We take some. And then, so we have this expression. And then it's not important precisely what the formula is, but what we do is what we wanted to compute is obtained by summing over all ways how to write uh, the first term class we had as a sum these classes in the second cohomology. The Zyber Quickly invariant of the first times the coefficient of S to the zero of this thing we define. So it's a complicated thing and it's much more complicated in fact because I didn't tell you what the thing is. But so we have a terrible formula. But the advantage is we have before we had a, a simple formula on the terrible space, now we have a terrible formula on the simple space. And so that kind of turns out to be better, although that's not obvious. And so let me just finish. So so we have these things that we want to so we want to compute the coefficient of s to the zero of this in order to answer our question. So we don't know what this is. So if we don't know what something is, we put it into a generating function. Not always. So now we make a generating function for these things we don't know. But if we knew them, we would know the answer to our question. And so instead of looking at one of them at a time, we look at all of them at the same time and try to see whether we can state something in general. And so there is this result that in some way, this thing is simple. So the way it depends on these classes, A1, A2, and the surface is just by some simple numbers, the intersection A1 squared, A1, A2, A2 squared, and so on. Um, and the way it depends on it is just that you have seven universal power series and you just, the whole generating function is the product of these for the corresponding power. So the way the geometry goes into the formula is just in this way, right, what the powers are. And so this is the result. Oh, but this is actually a bit of an, we had so very long time ago, this Ellingford and Lane, we proved this for similar integrals on Hilbert things point, and the uh, modification of the argument to show that. Um, I mean, I can maybe explain it or maybe not. Uh, and then given that one basically done. So, so if we, so therefore, we need to know these seven universal power series and we know everything. And so we want to know them. How do we, can we know them? So in order to know them, we only need to look seven examples of the circles and two line bundles on them. So if I take seven triples of a surface and the line bundle, such that the tuple of these numbers is linearly independent, then if I know this result for them, I can invert and compute the AI. And so, uh, so I only need to find those, and I can do this very simple. I can take 
for instance, my purpose has to be to two and one or two and two one and take either O and or O of one for the time bound. And so if I do that, now we have uh, S is a smooth Fourier surface. So it's a surface with an action of C star times C star with finite dimension fixed points. And uh, then you have an action on the surface. The action lifts to an action on the inverse smooth points by just pulling back the flat scheme. And it turns out the action has still finite dimension fixed points. In fact, you can, uh, one can easily see that the fixed points are parameterized by partitions of by tuples of partitions. Um, and if you look at the things you want to compute, these are, if, if you see what, you, know, you can use then uh, equivalent localization, which means you have to see what happens at the fibers over the fixed points. And the fibers over the fixed points, you have somehow uh, you see the representation theory of these partitions, and you can uh, therefore compute the contribution of every fixed point in terms of the combinatorics of partitions. And so this whole thing uh, can be computed in terms of combinatorics of partitions. Now, we haven't been quite smart enough to, to solve this in our heads, but one can easily write a program which computes these things to a very high order and, uh, and then gets us. These results. So maybe that's what I what I wanted to say. Yes. Are you going to write yourself? Yes. Maybe questions online. I don't know whether can they actually say something. Yeah, I should. There is nothing in the chat. Maybe I I don't know whether it will stay there. But yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, then thank yeah, you okay. for the very nice talk. Thank you. Uh -huh. Not too much over there. But I think it's going to be a bit tough, but it's very nice. Okay. Well, anyway, I, I promise that the actual lectures are a little bit slower. <laughs> but maybe you will have to Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, certainly, yeah. I have to. There are so many, you know, I went over so many details. Yeah. So after you function that you get the answer, you found them by coding. Like you found yeah. them, you found them. Yeah, yeah, well, but not the close. I mean, I, I compute the not first, just so, so many, the first, whatever, in some cases, for, for this stuff, maybe the first 30 coefficients, but then you can, oh. you know, can check. And, you know, also uh, in higher range, you, you get many coefficients, and then you can, you can read off what the model forms are. But obviously, it would be nice to, so people are at least yeah, if there are no questions, I think. <laughs>